Hello and welcome to the Center for Healthy Sex guest webinar sex expert series. I'm Douglas Evans and along with Alex Katahakis, we operate Center for Healthy Sex here in Los Angeles to offer a wide variety of sex therapy services for men, women, and couples, both uh, locally here in Los Angeles as well as around the world through our Skype and intensive programs. Uh, if you're interested further in our therapeutic services, you can reach us every day on our phone line at 310-843-9902, also our website, centerforhealthysex.com. One of the things we also enjoy offering is public education around all topics of sex, sexuality and sex therapy and uh, sex addiction treatment on a wide variety of topics. And today, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Lori Mintz, who is a therapist, author, professor, and speaker. And I will be introducing her in just a moment. I also just want to remind you, if you have a friend who would enjoy this presentation but can't make it today, this will be recorded and placed on our YouTube channel. And when you go on uh, within YouTube in the search section, if you type in Center for Healthy Sex, you can easily find our wide variety and library of videos of excellent uh, presenters, such as Dr. Mintz. We're also uh, proud publishers of several books on treating various sexual concerns, uh, such as Sex Addiction as Affectus Regulation, uh, Mirror of Intimacy, and Erotic Intelligence, all of which can be found easily on Amazon. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today, your presenter, uh, Lori Mintz. Uh, her life's work uh, is a commitment to helping people live fuller, richer lives through the art and science of psychology. She's a tenured professor at University of Florida where she teaches psychology of human sexuality to many, many grad undergraduate students every year. She also teacher, teaches and mentors graduate students, helping them find their own niche as psychologists. And she's published over 50 research articles in academic journals, six chapters in academic books, and has received numerous professional and teaching awards. She's also a fellow of the American Psychological Association. In addition, Dr. Mintz is the author of two popular and highly acclaimed books, uh, both written for the aim of empowering women's sexuality. One is called Becoming Cliterate, Why Orgasm Equality Matters and How to Get It. And the other is A Tired Woman's Guide to Passionate Sex, for Reclaiming Your Desire and Reigniting Your Relationship. So uh, her goal is to provide sex-positive, scientifically accurate education, especially to enhance female pleasure. She's also a regular blogger on Psychology Today and is frequently quoted in national media. She also maintains a small private practice in her spare time, and one of her greatest honors is to help clients reach their goals to live fuller and more authentic lives. So today's topic is uh, probably most likely based on her book, is Becoming Cliterate, and I present to you Dr. Lori Mintz. And thank you, Dr. Mintz, for your presentation today. Thank you for having me on. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to my webinar on Becoming Cliterate, and that part is intended. I hope after this webinar you come and come and come again. Um, as you'll see, I find this topic very serious, but I do have a little punny sense of humor that you may um, hear throughout the presentation. Speaking of the presentation and how it will go, it is, as you know, an hour, and I will take questions throughout especially if they're about what I'm talking about, I may choose if it's not right on topic to just say, hey, let's hold that to the end. And in terms of the questions, um, please don't use the Q&A feature of any meeting, but instead put all your questions in um, the, um, the, com the chat box um, to the left, which they just told you to use. So you'll see that pop up. So let me start by introducing the reason that I wrote uh, Becoming Cliterate. Um, as you've heard, I'm a licensed psychologist. I've been seeing clients for gender and sexual issues for over 25 years. And I also taught graduate student sex therapy at the University of Missouri. But then about six years ago, I moved to the University of Florida. And that's where I began teaching about 175 students a year um, human sexuality. And 
My students, okay. Oh, there we go. There's a little delay there. My students tell me that I remind them of the mother and the sex therapist in Meet the Fockers. Maybe you see a resemblance, maybe not. I think it's because I have curly hair, a large nose, and because I tell lots of stories about my sex therapy practice and my personal life. My students also describe me as quirky because I sometimes say what they consider outrageous or surprising things. As example, on the first day of class, I tell my students my qualifications for teaching the class. And one of the qualifications I tell them is that I've been having orgasms longer than they've been alive. Um, and they're usually a little shocked. Um, but then on a more serious note, in terms of my students, it was their experiences, their frustrations, as well as their successes that inspired me to write this book. In a nutshell, through teaching this class, I became aware that as many as 50% of young adult women were having trouble experiencing orgasm during partnered sex, whereas young men weren't having this same problem. In other words, I became aware of the orgasm gap between women and men. Um, and as you'll hear in a little more detail later, the orgasm gap really is pertains to heterosexual sex. And that's why I'm going to focus there, because it is a heteronormative topic. This discussion will be heteronormative because the problem that I'm addressing, the orgasm gap, occurs in heterosexual um, sex. However, I will give information when I get to the skills section um, that pertains to everyone in um, lesbian sex, heterosexual sex, et cetera. The other caveat I want to give before I get going is that I'm well aware that um, gender doesn't just exist on a binary and that some people with clitorises identify um, as male. So I'm going to use the words male and female, but for simplicity's sake, but I hope that won't turn anyone off. And I hope that you'll understand that I do am aware that um, anyone who has a clitoris or anyone who has sex with someone who has a clitoris can benefit from this information. Okay, anyway, so back to the orgasm gap itself. Through talking to my students, through digging into the research and clinical literature, I really began to grasp the cultural reasons for this gap. And so I started incorporating that information into several of my lectures. And what I found extremely meaningful was that at the end of every semester, I started getting emails and cards saying things like, thanks to the information in this class, I'm now orgasmic. Or thanks to what I learned, my girlfriend is now having orgasms. I also got many notes from young um, women in my class telling me that before the information in my class, they felt flawed. They felt that something was wrong with them. But through the information they learned, they were just fine, but that it was our cultural portrayal of women's pleasure that was really to blame. So I really became inspired to spread this information much more widely than my own classroom. And that's why I decided um, to write this book. I honestly can't think of a, um, a better way to um, give you a sense of the orgasm gap than is to read the first pages of the first chapter of Becoming Clitorate. Um, and if you've seen this movie, you'll understand why I portrayed um, this. If, and if you didn't, just looking at her face, you can probably tell. So here goes. Let me portray the orgasm gap by reading from the book. Hmm. You feel so good. Does that feel good, baby? No, not really, you think. Oh, yeah, you reply. You roll your eyes because, thankfully, in doggy style, he can't see your face. You're so ready for it to be over. He grunts enthusiastically, breathing hard. You sense he's about to come, so you start breathing hard and moaning, too. Yes, harder, deeper, you scream in order to hurry him to climax. He finally finishes and asks, did you come too? Yes, it was amazing, you lie. Can you relate? Sadly, most women can. Here's the deal. There's a huge pleasure gap between women and men. 
Men are having way more orgasms than women are. And while this isn't true in all types of sex, it's especially true in casual or hookup sex. Let me illustrate with some striking statistics. Among over 12,000 undergrads across 17 universities, 31% of men versus 10% of women reported reaching orgasm during first time hookup sex. Now, when I poll students using anonymous polling in my class, things are even worse where I'm teaching because among 500 students in my classes across about five years, 55% of men versus 4% of women say they usually orgasm during first time hookup sex. Put that 4% in your brain right over there and hold it because I'm going to come back to that number in a little bit. Um, now, perhaps you're thinking this is just a problem in hookup sex. Women aren't having their fair share of orgasms in hookup sex. Well, no. The orgasm gap does is biggest in first-time hookups. It gets smaller in second-time hookups, smaller in friends with benefits, and smaller in relationship sex. But it never closes altogether. As just one example, in one study, 85% of men versus 68% of women reported reaching orgasm during their last sexual encounter that occurred in the context of a relationship. Okay, then. Um, so what is the reason for this orgasm gap? Again, quoting from the book itself, in fact, picking off where I just left off, where she said it was amazing and lied, um, what the F is the problem? The F itself. There's way too much emphasis on intercourse, the way men reach orgasm. Movies and porn show women having fast and fabulous orgasms from male pounding alone, often without any foreplay. These images are lies. The idea that women should orgasm from intercourse alone is the number one lie women are told about getting laid. It's the primary reason for the pleasure gap. It's no wonder that the most common complaint asked um, of sex therapists is, how can I orgasm during intercourse? How That same question is the number one question sent into Cosmo Magazine. When I give my students the chance to ask anonymous questions, that is always the top question. How can I orgasm during intercourse? Or how can I help my girlfriend orgasm during sex? And by sex, they mean intercourse. Another problem which I will discuss in a minute. It's also no wonder that almost 70% of women fake orgasm during intercourse. Another great movie scene, Harry Met Sally, the famous fake orgasm scene in the restaurant. Um, if you haven't watched it in a while, Google it and just watch that scene. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, 70% of women fake orgasm during intercourse. And when asked why, the number one reason that they give is to avoid appearing abnormal. And they also talk about making their partner feel good about himself. So all of this is related to the cultural lie that women should orgasm from a thrusting penis. And it's the man's job to thrust hard and just right and last long to have this occur. So the first step to closing the orgasm gap is to provide realistic information on how women most reliably reach orgasm. Maybe you've heard the statistic in women's magazines, et cetera, that 70% of women don't organ orgasm. I was gonna say, I almost said organize, but 70% of women don't orgasm from intercourse alone. Um, interesting that 70%. Um, however, as, Anna, as pointed out by a very, very meticulous scholar who analyzed all these studies that came up with this number, most don't differentiate between women who can orgasm from just a thrusting penis and those who can orgasm during intercourse by making sure their clitoris is also being stimulated, perhaps by being in a position with which they can rub it against a man's body part or by touching it themselves with their hands or a vibrator. 
Um, however, when this differentiation was made in two different recent studies, they both came out with the number that 15% of women only have orgasms from thrusting alone. And the numbers get even smaller when I ask students about their most reliable way to reach orgasm. Again, over 500 women across five years in my class, when I asked, what is your most reliable route to orgasm? 19% say they rarely, if ever, orgasm with a partner. 34% say direct clitoral stimulation. 43% say intercourse plus direct clitoral stimulation. And 4% say intercourse alone. Do you remember a few minutes ago I said, keep that 4% in your mind when I talked about the polls in my class about those who orgasm during first time hookup sex? Well, here's something I've noticed every year it happens and it's just crazy. When I ask that question about hookup sex, sometimes the number is 2%, sometimes 3%, sometimes 4%. The average is 4%. But then weeks, weeks, weeks later, when I ask the question of reliable route to orgasm, that number is always the same. So if 2% of women say they orgasm during first time hookup sex in one class, 2% will say they orgasm with intercourse alone. It's 3%, 3%. What it tells me is the only women orgasm during first time hookup sex are those who orgasm from intercourse alone because women are not having, getting pleasure during first time hookups that's focused on them. Anyway, in also looking at this chart, if you take out those women who rarely orgasm and recalculate these numbers, what you will find is that 95% of women, 95% of women need some form of clitoral stimulation to reach orgasm, either alone or coupled with intercourse. Um, in fact, it seems to me from talking to women in my class reading, it's as if we have an orgasm hierarchy in our culture. And if you orgasm from thrusting alone, that's the best. Well, if you orgasm during intercourse and it's because you are pairing it with clitoral stimulation, that's second best. If you need direct clitoral stimulation alone, well, that's the loser. That's the last. Um, that's, that's just um, baloney. Um, I could use another word that starts with B, but I'll say that's baloney. And that's something I'm really hoping to change, this idea we constantly have of how women should orgasm in what is the right way for a woman to orgasm. So again, to be repetitive, the orgasm gap between women and men is due to women not getting the clitoral stimulation they need um, to experience orgasm. Let me illustrate this even further with two additional related gaps. First of all, women are much more likely to orgasm when having sex with a woman than with a man. That's because in lesbian sex, penetration is only incorporated if the woman finds that enhances her pleasure. And there is nothing wrong with penetration. It definitely enhances pleasure for many women. It's very enjoyable. It's just that it's not alone orgasmic for many women. Also, while some people say that lesbian sex is orgasmic because if you have a clitoris, you'll know what to do with it, that's not true because of another very, very important point I want to underscore. And that is that every woman's nerves are distributed just a little bit differently across her genitals. None are the same. So what it takes to orgasm differs woman by woman. So I believe that lesbian sex is orgasmic because having a clitoris teaches you that you need to ask your partner how hers likes to be stimulated. Another gap that underscores my point is that women are much more likely to be nearly or always orgasmic when alone than with a partner. In fact, 92% of women orgasm when they are pleasuring themselves. Again, compare that to the dire numbers we just talked about earlier with a partner. 
And in fact, speaking of women's self-pleasure, um, another interesting statistic, this from Cher Heights stu landmark study, only 1.2% of women pleasure themselves exclusively by putting something in their vagina. 12% do so by pairing clitoral stimulation and penetration. In the rest, the other 80 some percent focus on clitoral stimulation alone. And 92% reach orgasm often in a very short amount of time. So what's the takeaway message? Women know what they need when they're alone, but they forgo this when with the male partner thinking they should get there differently and they put their focus on his pleasure and on orgasming during intercourse. And in fact, another study found that 78% of women's orgasm problems when a sexual encounter involves intercourse is, not, is due to not ha getting enough or the right kind of clitoral stimulation. Okay then, so maybe you think that closing the orgasm gap is pretty simple. All we need to do is make sure women know about their clitorises and get that kind of stimulation when with men. Well, not so simple. A few studies have found that teaching women about their clitorises increases their orgasm rate during self-pleasure, but not during partnered sex. So this leads to the conclusion that while an overvaluing of male um, pleasure and an undervaluing of clitoral stimulation, and that cultural lie is the primary culprit for the orgasm gap, it's not the only culprit. There are other reasons for the pleasure gap. First is slut shaming, calling a woman a slut for having sex. And it's hard to enjoy sex you're called a slut for having. Why do I have Amber Rose there? She's got this great video called The Walk of No Shame. Google it and look it up at some point. It's her coming out of a house. She's clearly had a sexual encounter and she's walking home. And instead of the walk of no shame, it's the walk, of, I'm sorry, the walk of shame, it's the walk of no shame. She walks along and people congratulate her on a night of great sex. And the mayor gives her a key to the city. It's, it's, it's really a wonderful video. And also, since I'm doing this webinar in Los Angeles, I want to point out that on October 1st, Amber Rose is hosting her annual slut walk in L.A., a walk to stop victim blaming um, for sexual violence. Um, objectifying media images. We see these images of women whose role is to please men, to look good. And it, it's what it, that do, those images do, they put our focus on how do we look versus how do we feel. And it results in the, if it's good for him, it's a good for me mentality. Also, those same images lead many, many women to dislike their body. And it's very hard to enjoy sex when you are wondering if you don't look good, if you, feel, if you look fat, if your stomach is pooching out. It is impossible to have an orgasm while you are thinking those things or trying to hold your stomach in. I will confess to you, I know this not only as a psychologist, but because I wasted a lot of years trying that myself. It doesn't work. You need to be completely in the moment and not worrying about your body to enjoy sex. And we'll get to that a little more later. And our faulty sex education system. Our sex education system does not mention the word cl the clitoris. It does not mention pleasure. Um, and so in the absence of that, we often get our sex ed through porn, which again has those false images. And again, we have no training, zero training in sexual communication. And because what every woman needs to orgasm is different, that sexual communication is very, very important. Complicating that communication is our language around sex and women's genitals is very problematic. I have an entire chapter on this in Becoming Clitorate. And while truth be told, 
It's actually my favorite chapter in the book. I love this linguistic analysis. I find it very powerful and telling. Um, I'm going to just talk about it briefly here so I can get to the self-help um, portion of this webinar. Um, but in short, uh, we uh, equate sex with intercourse and relegate all of it before to foreplay. I mean, in our culture, sex means intercourse. So it means everything else doesn't really count. That's the big, that's the main event. And foreplay is just what comes before to build up to this main event. And if you start noticing these words, I see it every day. If you see articles that say, oh, the best sex position for her orgasm, they will all tell about these intercourse positions, but they don't mention the clitoris. So it's the craziness becomes clear. Also, we call everything down there a vagina. And in doing so, we obscure women's most erotic organs. I'm going to tell a story. I was with a mother who is an OBGYN. And she was with her two children. And the um, little girl said, Mom, why can't I pee standing up like Johnny? And she said, oh, that's because you, um, that's because you have a vagina and he has a penis. Well, this is, again, an OBGYN. You do not pee out of the vagina. You pee out of the urethra. The vagina is where penises go in and babies come out, yet we call everything down there a vagina. That would be like saying, are you hearing me talk out of my nose? Oh, it doesn't matter because it might be my mouth, my nose. It's all the same. It's on my face. But it does matter because by calling everything down there a vagina, we are really rele relegating women's most erotic organ to nameless invisibility. Some scholars have gone so far as to call this a symbolic genital mutilation. Here's another softer quote I like from the defunct Tumblr site, V is for vulva. What isn't named doesn't exist. And every time someone uses the word vagina, when they really mean vulva, they're, they're erasing some of the parts of women's sexual organs that give them the most pleasure. It's time we stop making ourselves and parts of our bodies invisible, and that starts with the right language. In terms of the white language, the right language is vulva, clitoris, but we are uncomfortable with the word clitoris. There's discomfort and silence around women's most orgasmic organ. Until we solve this cultural problem, penis will remain a commonplace term. On the other hand, similar to Voldemort in the infamous Harry Potter series, the clitoris will remain she who must not be named. In fact, I get lots of giggles when I say the name of my book, Clitorate, Becoming Clitorate. And I hope that, that it, it, it reflects the cultural discomfort, but I also hope it does something to get the word more in the mainstream. Also, here's a quick interesting fact. Some linguists say we have more nicknames for the word penis than any other in all of the English language, yet there is very few, almost no common nicknames for the clitoris. So I actually, part of my linguistic analysis book is suggesting some nicknames, and much like we name the penis Dick or Harry or Tom or, you know, Johnson, um, I suggest we call the uh, clitoris, female names like Tori, Cleo. Those are a few of the names I have suggested. Okay, then. I spent a lot of time talking about the causes of the orgasm gap and the cultural changes needed to close it. Um, but remember earlier when I told you that when you teach women about their clitoris, they can orgasm during self-love, but not during partner sex. So more is needed than just awareness and language change. We need individual skills and attitudes as well. That's why when I wrote Becoming, Becoming Clitorate, I divided it into sections. Some focused on cultural analysis and some focused on self-help. 
Actually, I didn't really divide it into sections, S-E-C-T-I-O-N-S. I divided it into sections, S-E-X-T-I-O-N-S. I wish I could say I was clever, but if you look at a keyboard, um, the C and the X are next to each other. And I made a typo one day, and then I looked at my screen and I was like, oh, that's great. I want to call my divide my book into sections. So now I will turn to the individual attitudes, knowledge, and skills needed to experience orgasm. Um, the first thing is a knowledge of your own anatomy. And I'm going to show just a few, not all, of the pictures from section four, which I call Let's Look Under the Hood, another pun on clitoral hood. Um, and what the picture on the left is simply a picture of a woman's vulva. And um, it illustrates where all the external parts are. And basically those parts that are most, uh, have the most touch sensitive nerve endings are all on the outside of a woman's vulva, not on the inside in her vagina. There's the clitoral hood, and the glands beneath it, which are often very, very sensitive and don't like to be touched directly, but like to be stimulated by the hood above it or by the inner lips, um, which are actually um, an analogous um, to the head of a man's penis, very sensitive, very full of nerves. And also, if you look at the diagram, you'll see that the inner lips attach to the clitoris in two places, which is why for some women, stimulating pulling on the inner lips is very erotic. The next picture is a picture of real women's vulvas. And because of porn images have unrealistic images of very large penises, they also have very unrealistic images of petite, even inner lips in uniform small vulvas. That's not how vulvas look. Each vulva is beautiful. It's like a unique snowflake. And if you look at this uh, panel of vulvas from the empowering site, Gynodiversity, you'll see the vast differences in personalities in women's vulvas. And some inner lips are larger than the outer lips and protrude. Most inner lips are uneven. Some clitoral hoods are large, some are small. There is a vast um, variety, but sadly, because women don't know this, we're increasingly seeing another kind of body image um, issue among women, and that's genital shame. So it's very important to normalize um, what vulvas look like. It's also very important to um, look at yourself, and that picture there is simply um, talking um, before the section in the book where um, women are told to examine themselves. Because if you don't know what you have and are not accustomed to it, you won't know how to play with it and enjoy it. And then it's very important to know about your clitoris. And that is a picture of the clitoris, um, also with the vagina and something called the clitoral balls, which are important. And I just want to point out, I am wearing a clitoris necklace and I have gold clitoris earrings on. So sometimes I like to wear these not only when I'm giving a presentation, but just out and about. And people are like, what's that strange shape? because we don't know, we don't get taught about the clitoris, so most don't know about this. Also in this picture, what I want to illustrate on the picture on the right is how far the clitoral glands is from the vaginal opening. Now, that, so that you can see why a thrusting penis would not often stimulate those the clitoris. Now, some people say that women who orgasm a, from thrusting alone do so because those clitoral bulbs that surround the vagina are being stimulated. Others say because as a penis thrusts in and out, it will pull those inner lips in just the right way as to move the clitoral hood and the, stimulate the glands. Because remember when I was showing you that the lips are attached to that. So the penis in and out pulls the lips, then pulls the hood, 
and stimulates the glands. But as stated by another author, pulling on your cheeks will get your ears to move. But if you really want your ear to move, why not just move it directly? Also, interestingly, some research shows that the distance between the clitoral glands and the vagina, if it's more than an inch, you are much less likely to orgasm during intercourse. Again, demonstrating this isn't something women should be doing or can learn to do necessarily. It's, it is biology. It's our biology. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with our biology. So get to know your own biology and um, where your sensitive parts are and how. How do we do that? Now I'm going to talk about the individual skills needed to experience orgasm. Um, and that's from section three of my book, Time Has Come for You to Come. And the first thing to do is to train the sex organ between your ears. And you need to first identify and change thought patterns. So that slut shaming, for example, uh, stop slut shaming yourself. Think se sex positive thoughts about how I'm entitled to orgasm, my pleasure is important. And talk to yourself, tell yourself things like that. Work on body positivity. Um, I love my body for what it can do. I love that my body's capable of exercise. Also, very interestingly, one type of exercise, yoga, has been found to increase orgasm and sexual functioning. And I think that's because yoga helps us learn mindfulness. What is mindfulness? If you look at this picture, it demonstrates the, the parent and child are walking and the parent's thinking of everything but what's happening in the moment and the child is seeing what is only before them. I also I like to say mindfulness is putting your mind and your body in the same place. Sometimes we can be doing one thing and thinking another. We can be in the middle of having receiving oral sex and think about an email we have to do or if we smell funny. And mindfulness is be putting your mind and body in the same place. I also talk to people about, and I want to talk to you about how it's like a roller coaster. Whether you like riding it or not, if you've ever ridden one, you're going up, 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 and you're thinking if you're like me, oh no, am I buckled in? Oh no, I wish I wouldn't have gotten on this thing. Oh, I wish I could get off. I hope this is over soon. But then as you start going downhill, you stop thinking at all and you're just feeling. And that's what mindfulness is. It is just feeling, being in the moment, and also learning to bring yourself back to the moment when your mind invariably wanders, which it does. So I advocate learning mindfulness in one's daily life first, little moments, brushing your teeth can be a mindful moment, and then to apply it to uh your sex life, to your sex life alone and by yourself. So basically the take home message to train your mind is to think sex positive thoughts when you're not having a sexual encounter and turn off your busy brain when you are having a sexual encounter. Then the next section, the next step after training your brain is to take matters into your own hands. So what do I mean by that? First, get comfortable with the idea of masturbation or self-love. And some people have spiritual concerns. Um, and what I like to point out to them is some really nice spiritual writings. In fact, the Center for Healthy Sex's Mirror of Intimacy has some of those spiritual writings about how our genitals are in reach of our hands. And I also, um, and many New Age spiritual leaders will also say that the Bible isn't against masturbation. So I don't have time to get into all that now, but if you have questions on that, I'm happy to answer them. And I also address it in the book. Then I think it's also important to learn about masturbation's health benefits. And that will teach you that it's a good thing to do. Um, it decreases um, illnesses, it, it strengthens your immune system, it's good for stress, it's good for sleep, 
Um, it's good for all kinds of health. So it's good for us. And then watch some great role models. There are two I recommend strongly. Betty Dotson holds orgasm trainings for women individually and in in groups. And if you go to her website, there's a video of her teaching a woman, Carol, to orgasm through masturbation. It is a very powerful video. Whenever I show it in the class that I teach, my students say it makes them feel more normal. It teaches them something new. Although some say they feel angry that no one taught them before. Um, and then there's OMG Yes, which is a website that shows different women's masturbation techniques and it categorizes them into different techniques. It even has touchscreen technology so you can practice on a vulva, a uh, virtual vulva. And then just take your time and bring yourself to orgasm. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, just take your time. When my clients are uncomfortable with this, I tell them to think of this as a doctor's prescription. Go home and orgasm, go home and masturbate. And so if it helps you think of it as the same way. Um, and then there's lots of different add-ons for pleasure and problem solving. Many women don't orgasm for the first time until they use a clitoral vibrator. Um, some women need to relax first, take a bubble bath. If, if you are someone who drinks alcohol, a sip or two of wine or something. Conversely, some women need to be energized. They best or reach orgasm after coming back from a run when their blood is flowing. Some women like to read erotica. There's some good feminist erotica. Search feminist erotica, read or watch something arousing. Um, some women who are not orgasming during self-love, it's because they're not breathing. They're holding their breath or they're holding their hips tight. So try working with the breath. Try um, rocking your hips. And then there's edging and other strategies in OMGS. Edging is just one where you, every time you think you're getting close, you back off and then you and touch somewhere else. And then you go back to the touch that was arousing, then you back off again. So there's many, many strategies but take, I really find that as women take the time and get comfortable, they will reach orgasm during self-love. And then, though, how to translate this into partnered sex? Well, if we have a cultural script in our culture for sex, foreplay, intercourse, his orgasm, hers may be faked, sex over. So when I thought about this, I thought, I want to write new scripts, new plays, where the female orgasm is the center of the play. And these are inclusive of lesbian and heterosexual sex. And here's just a few examples. In this play, you come first. That could be oral sex during which you orgasm, followed by intercourse. Or it could be oral sex turn taking. So a turn-taking model of sex where you come first, or you could come second. For example, you could have enough clitoral stimulation for high arousal and then intercourse. And that's very important because if a woman has intercourse before she's highly aroused, it will be painful. She won't be lubricated enough. Her cervix won't have pulled out of the way enough, which happens in high arousal. He has his orgasm. Then he comes out and then he uses his hand or a vibrator um, to stimulate you to orgasm or manual oral um, turn taking. These are just a few of many ideas for these new uh, sexual scripts. Or how about only you come? Asynchronous turn taking. I've had two male readers write to me and say, I do this. I just pleasure my partner until she reaches orgasm. One wrote me and said, I do it every Sunday. And some people hear this and they go, oh my God, that's so weird. I could never just like lay there and have my partner stimulate me to orgasm and not orgasm. And I say to that, well, that's kind of what's happening anyway in our already, you know, uh, plays. And now I'm not saying this is the only form of sex, but you can engage in asynchronous turn-taking if you want to with a partner 
um, where you pleasure him one night, the next time he pleasures you. And it takes a lot of the pressure off for some people. Or you could come together. And in that kind of play, you often think of 69, but most of my clients and students tell me that's too much going on. So another way to come together is during intercourse due to clitoral stimulation through your own hand, your partner's hand, a handheld vibrator, or there's some couple vibrators. There's some cock rings with the clitoral um, vibrator attached to it you can find in sex toy stores like Babeland and Good Vibrations um, to come during intercourse, during um, intercourse through the clitoral stimulation. But please, please, please don't expect to aim for simultaneous orgasm because an orgasm requires you turning off your conscious brain and being completely mindfully focused in the moment. And if you're thinking, I got to time my orgasm with his orgasm, not going to happen. And in fact, a lot of sex experts say it's best not to aim for simultaneous orgasm because you can then really enjoy feeling your partner experience orgasm and he or she can feel the same towards you. Okay, so maybe you think these scripts are just terrific and you want to try them, but how do you talk to your partner? And that is the last individual skill that's needed. The other C, not the clitoris, but communication. And again, in this short webinar, I can't tell you everything that's in this chapter, but let me briefly say that we need to replace faulty beliefs about communication. The one culprit is I shouldn't have to ask. They should know. Partners don't read minds. We must tell and ask. Also, communication skills. I have eight general ones in the book, but my three favorite are don't ask questions that aren't questions, like, do you want to have sex tonight? It's not really a question because it could mean I'm really horny and I hope you do, or it could mean I'm so exhausted, I hope you don't. Um, and if you know, so if you say, do you want to have sex? And your partner says, yes. And you meant, oh, I really don't want to. Problem. Make I statements. I want to have sex tonight. I'm really tired. I'd like to cuddle tonight. And meta communication. These are general communications. Communicating about communication. I have something I want to talk to you about and I'm a little nervous. I hope you don't get defensive. Or I see this conversation is going downhill fast. We're both defensive. I don't want it to be like that. And of course, communicating during sex. I call kitchen table sex talks, talk problem solving talks outside of the bedroom. I'd like us to find have sex where we incorporate more clitoral stimulation. Talking before sex. What do you want to do? How do you want to do it? During sex. Very, very important. People, the movies pretend that nobody talks during sex and everyone knows what to do, but real life sex requires communication, faster, slower. I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. And actually after sex, I think it helps for couples to talk. How was that? And it can, you can then revel in how good it was, or you can do, you know, it was great. And next time I'd like to do more of this. So lots and lots of talk about sex. And because my focus is on the clitoris, I also advocate clitoracy chats. Talking to your partner about what you need at a kitchen table sex top. If you feel inclined and, and safe and brave enough, I know it's hard for many women, show your partner how you touch yourself. And that will help them learn to touch you or watch OMG Yes together and talk about that. Communication is the bedrock of a good communication, and good communication can make your bed rock. So please learn good sexual communication, and then you can talk about all these other things that you want and need. And I want to say those are the skills, but in the book, I have more. I say, wait, there's more. Come again. And very briefly, um, I debunk vibrator myths. They're not addictive. They don't take the place of a partner. They simply provide the kind of intense stimulation that many women need to reach orgasm. 
Um, the myth of the simultaneous orgasm, I already talked about that. I'm not going to go over that again. And to know that sexual problems can be solved. They're actually very, very solvable problems. And, to, the, and sex is something that should be the, um, you should, it, lifelong learning. I wrote this book. I wrote another book. I teach about sex. I am always, every day I'd say I'd learn something new. So make it a topic of lifelong learning. And then I come back to my feminist uh, analysis and I say, let's have a call to action. Let's start teaching other women about the lies that are being perpetuated. Let's change um, language so that we have an orgasm revolution. And indeed, um, the book ends with the 12 commandments for orgasm equality, or the women's section ends with the 12 commandments for orgasm equality and quality sex, psych, such as whenever I see lies about female sexuality per perpetrated, I will do my best to educate others. So if you're watching a movie where the woman goes, ah, with no foreplay for intercourse, you could say, you know, guys, that's a lie. Um, and I won't read them all, but um, basically you get um, the, the picture. And then I have a section for men because you don't have to have a clitoris to be clitorate where I summarize all of that um, information for men. I think that this orgasm revolution is going to require men and women working together, talking about equal opportunity pleasure. And in fact, let me end before I take some questions with my two favorite borrowed quotes that are in the book and that really illustrate to me what I mean by orgasm equality. The first is by Dr. Cornell West when talking about racial inequities in our healthcare system. He said, it's time to stop being so well adjusted to the injustice. Being well adjusted to the injustice means prioritizing his orgasm and not having prioritizing one of your own. Um, although I will say, while I focused a lot on orgasms, as I talk about in the book, making that too much of a goal, iron you know, it's ironic, right? Like that's the goal in a sense that you want, but if you're too goal focused, it won't happen. And that's the, where mindfulness comes in. And then my absolute favorite quote, which I believe really underlies what um, my message that I hope to get across today is, is again, um, doc, a doctor when talking about racial inequities in the healthcare system, there can't be true quality without equality. And there cannot be quality sex for two people unless both people's most reliable route to orgasm are viewed as equal and equally important. Um, so I hope that you've learned something. I hope that you've been inspired for orgasm equality um, in your own life. And um, if you'd like to ask a question now, um, please um, email um, the questions um, to Charlie at Center for Healthy Sex. He'll read them anonymously or ask me something in the chat box. Because I finally will say, as you're getting ready for your questions, that for people with clits, the revolution is coming. Okay, I have a question on the slide and I'm going to read it. Um, I'm working with a woman who, so this is from a healthcare provider or therapist, I assume. I'm working with a woman who's been able to masturbate to orgasm, but is now unable to orgasm. Um, there may be psychological blocks going on that we're exploring, but we're wonder if her diabetes could be interfering. You, now, while I'm not a medical personnel, I have read that. That indeed, because diabetes interferes with blood flow, that that could be a problem. So I would definitely um, have that person see their healthcare provider. And whenever someone um, has been able to orgasm in the past and then stops, 
Certainly there could be psychological issues going on, but there are also some medical issues sometimes that need to be explored. And that, that makes me realize too, the antidepressants um, also block women's um, orgasmic capacity, make the orgasms go from a 10 on the Richter scale to a one or a zero. So that's another thing. Um, and someone just complimented me on my puns and I um, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, here's another great question. How can parents help ensure cliteracy with their children? Oh, I love that question. Because if we start there, we won't have an orgasm gap. And I think it starts very young. To start talking to children, it's not a one-time conversation about sex, an ongoing age-appropriate conversation. But doing things like naming the parts appropriately, um, you know, who... Um, you know, your, your name, your vulva, your vulva, your clitoris, talk about the clitoris being the source of pleasure um, for um, girls, that kind of thing. In Norway, they start that very early. Um, and in, in sex ed, they talk about the vulva, they talk about the clitoris, they talk about pleasure. So um, I'd say start young. And then when your um, you know, children reach their sexual coming of age, um, giving them some reading material. Uh, my book, I Love Female Orgasm, any sex positive female book. Um, um, there is another question. Do you have more references um, to help me become more orgasmic, web, etc.? cetera? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, along with recommending honestly my own book, um, I would recommend I Love Female Orgasm. I would recommend Betty Dotson's website, search Dotson and Ross or Betty Dotson and just read, read, read all the things on her website, watch her YouTubes, um, uh, watch some of her videos, that Carol video is $3 to rent, um, watch OMG, yes. Um, I think all of those things um, would um, help you become more orgasmic and take the time take the time with yourself you deserve that pleasure bodies are built for pleasure and it's just fine to take that pleasure so resources but also just time with yourself buy some high quality lubricant um a clitoral vibrator and just start taking time with yourself Ah, I believe God created pleasure organs for a reason. Any tips on working with spiritual people who are reticent? I think it depends on the type of spirituality. Um, but I have, um, if you can find a sex positive religious figure, I've often referred my clients to someone besides myself to talk to about that. Um, I also have a client who found a book and i cannot recall the name of it right now but if you will go to my website and email me i'll find that name for you and it was a christian sex positive book and she came to me after reading that and she said i just realized that my clitoris is god's gift for me and i should use it and use it well and i've used that line over and over again, um, that it's the only organ in the entire body dedicated to just pleasure. It's there for a reason. Our bodies are perfect. And so it's in, they're intended for pleasure. Um, and I also use the quote from Mirror of Intimacy about our hands, are, our bodies are designed, so our hands have free reign, free reach to our genitals. I think that design was for a reason too. Uh, one more question just came in. My husband is a sex addict and in recovery. Um, now I can, question mark, reach orgasm on the rare occasions we have sex. I don't like to masturbate because that is he got how he got started as an addict. Okay, well, I'm sorry for the pain that you've been through. Um, having a partner with a serious issue like that. Um, 
I'm really glad that you still can reach orgasm. That's wonderful. Um, however, I would like to say that just because your husband had a problem with masturbation doesn't mean that you will. Um, the, and the latest research I found is that actually um, a small number of people get addicted. And if you don't have an addictive personality, I would not be concerned about that. It might not be something you want to like openly sort of say, I did this 10, you know, today and tomorrow, but it is a very important private activity. And for women, um, it also is very, very much research that masturbating keeps your genital tissue um, in good shape. Also, Marty Klein, um, I heard a podcast by him and he said something that made a lot of sense to me. And that is that it's not necessarily the masturbation that causes a problem. It's the masturbating to porn. And so um, that I don't know if that's true for your husband, but that it's really not the masturbation that it's the problem. It's the masturbating to porn. So to encourage you to um, masturbate, keep yourself healthy. Um, and not to worry about addiction. I have um, some food allergies. I use that metaphor. And my husband still eats those foods. They're a big problem for me, but they're not a problem for him. So I hope that helps you. Yes. Um, someone just mentioned She Comes First is also a good resource um, by Ian Kerner. She Comes First is if you remember those plays, it's all about one of those first plays. It's all about oral sex. It's all about how to perform oral sex. And for it's an excellent, excellent book for those people who most reliably orgasm from oral sex. It really teaches their partner how to do that. I also, I love that book. I love Ian Kerner. I also want to say that however you orgasm and experience it is okay. I do know some women who don't enjoy oral sex and feel like they're weird or something, but that's okay too. But yes, I love that book. Thank you for um, reminding me about that. Okay, I think it is um, time to wrap up. I thank you for coming and I hope you come again. <laughs>